the Qin Dynasty, approximately 221 to 206 BCE. The Qin Dynasty was founded by King Cheng, and the Qin were able to unify a large part of China and establish Xiang as their capital. King Cheng, once he was in power, proclaimed himself Shi Di, which means the first emperor of China. He's kind of an interesting guy. Um, he created a modern central capital at Xiang with city planning and public works. He standardized the language, the weight system, and money. And he centralized the government. He also unified um, a series of walls that were north of his province, his territory. And today they're known as the Great Wall. It was just basically a series of walls that were meant to keep out the Mongols from the north. And he decided to create a, a stronger wall system. And so he implemented his power and basically built this incredibly large wall and established a territory that was pretty humongous. One of the things that he did do that was kind of negative was he was against Confucianism and he regularly burned Confucian texts and he persecuted the scholars. However, he did patronize the arts and he created tons of palaces. And one of the things that he's most well known for is the tomb that he created. Probably the, the biggest artifacts that we know about from the tomb or the ones that are the most popular to study are these life-size warriors. They stand literally life-size, probably larger than life for them because they're five foot eight. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth. But if you compare it against this uh, sort of warrior, apotropaic bronze figure from the Shang dynasty, you can see that he, his dynasty really took a leap and is kind of an anomaly. In fact, the sculptures that you see here are more realistic than most things that we're going to see until probably the Tang Dynasty later on. His tomb was discovered by some peasants digging for a well, and then they found, they struck some artifacts in a bamboo mat and, and uh, started digging at it, and they excavated it, and it was this enormous, large space. And we know that it took him about 38 years to create. Uh, he, he actually began it before his rise to power. And it combines a palace and a, a series of army barracks in a way. His tomb itself, the actual tomb, which is the burial mound, is not excavated yet and there are some problems with the government and they're waiting for some money to be able to excavate it but one of the things that they are have done so far is that they've excavated the terracotta warriors and the horse pits and and lots of sites around it and we also know that he actually had several kiln sites built on site because of how long it would have taken to create so many of the soldiers This is a model of the grounds, and you can see that pyramidic structure is actually where his tomb would be. And apparently, you know, according to legend, it's uh, laid. It has uh, mercury rivers, and it's got constellations laid out in pearl on the ceiling. But uh, I guess they're still going to wait to excavate it. The reason why the the statues exist today and are so well preserved probably has something to do with actually the fact that he was really disliked after his death. On his death, one of the things that they did uh, was there was a peasant uprising and they went and they burnt um, down his tomb. Unfortunately, if you look at this diagram, you can see that these sculptures were placed in sort of phalanxes and tunnels underneath the ground and then they put wood on top with timbers and a woven fiber mat and then earth on top of it and apparently what probably happened is when they were burning it down uh, it preserved and fired the mud and the clay on top and actually preserved quite a lot of stuff inside of it. Pit number one is full of uh, the foot soldiers, and when they excavated it, it was quite a hard excavation because these things are actually very delicate. And the tombs themselves, they face east towards the states that they were fighting against. 
And um, the sculptures that they found, some of them were absolutely intact and had bronze daggers and lances and things like that. But some of them were quite damaged. And this is the state that some of those sculptures would have been found in. Pit number two contained the cavalry, and it actually contained bronze chariots, large life-size horses, complete with um, all of the gear that would be needed to uh, run the horses. This chariot has a sort of umbrella-like structure on it. And you can see that the horses are extremely realistic and were made to, to really correspond to what they knew in real life. An interesting element about the chariots is that one of the chariots has that umbrella that we saw um, of the shaman riding on the dragon up to the heavens. Pit number three was decorated like a tent, contained the officers. A lot has been made about the style of the faces and the unique qualities of each of the sculptures because there are thousands of these sculptures. And the way that they were made, it's kind of an interesting technique. They were actually made by plumbers who had made pipes. And you can see that they're actually almost like Barbie dolls or G.I. Joes where you can take different heads off and put different heads and arms on. So they're made in a sort of component manufacturing way. And because of this, they were actually able to paint each one differently. And so there's a, a lot of variety, especially the fact that these were so easy to make. They were made with the coiling method. And then they, so most of them are, are hollow and that makes them very delicate and hard to um, transport but it also makes it interchangeable in terms of parts. After they were made, they were assembled and then they were painted. And you can see here that there's traces of paint on these. So they weren't all just white or clay colored. And we know who some of the artisans who made these were because they signed their pipes and some of them signed the, uh, the soldiers as well. If you look at the facial types on these sculptures, you can actually see that there's a wide variety of how they look in the faces. And so probably the faces were either made by a mold method or they were made by coiling and then pressing a mold on it and then details were added into it afterwards. And one of the things that uh, there have been studies about it, the what variety of, of statues there are, and it seems like there's probably about 200 different varieties depending on how you interchange the parts on these on these figures. But an interesting component to some of it is also the fact that the details on them are so lifelike and so realistic that we get a sense of how they dressed, what, what armor they wore, what kinds of rankings they were, even how their hair looked. I think one of the things that's the most exciting for some scholars about finding this tomb is that first it proves the existence of the first emperor of Qin where China got its name. And it also gives us a really good snapshot or picture of how the army was arranged and what kind of weapons they used and how they dressed and how they prepared themselves for battle.